I'd like you to turn tonight to the Gospel of John chapter 13. The Gospel of John chapter number 13, and I think that uh, many of you have studied the Word of God for many, many years, and I think you will agree with this statement that as you continue to study it, you'll find this book is an amazing book with many inexhaustible truths. And the more that you ponder the teaching of the Bible, uh, the more that you will be amazed at its depth. It's pretty neat that I get paid to do this. And uh, it's uh, an incredible privilege to be able to study it. I often try to place my mind um, and myself into the various scenes of the Word of God. And as I do so, I find the passages uh, tend to become much richer with insight. But I also find that there are some passages that are very difficult for us to comprehend. And then there are other passages that would present truths in simply an unforgettable manner. Some passages such as the one we're considering in this message are shocking at first glance. And they provide us with a truth that is an unexpected manner by revealing it in a setting that nobody could possibly have imagined. And those are oftentimes the truths that are the basis of lifelong memories. I would say that the account in John chapter 13 is most likely not one the disciples forgot. It would be one that we might say is a memory that is permanently engraved as something that might be etched in stone. These are often disturbing on some levels because of the implications of the account, but at the same point in time, they also help us to shape and mold our life in an image that is ultimately pleasing to God. And I think that is the essence here of this passage in John chapter number 13. We're in a message that I've entitled Ingredients of Biblical Leadership. And I began this morning with a thesis that was a rather lengthy statement, and we'll take and develop a little bit more of this here tonight as well. Uh, the premise is this, that we need spirit-guided men committed to service-minded leadership who seek the well-being of those they lead over the advancement of their own agenda. Uh, underneath of that, then, we acknowledge that such men are wholeheartedly committed to biblical truth, personal integrity, and godly priorities in their own lives, and continuously invest their lives in instilling those same values in the lives of those whom they lead. They are a model to follow as they humbly point others to Christ. And I believe this is the type of man uh, that we need in our church today. We also found that there are two aspects that we're going to key in on. One we already observed this morning, and that is being spirit-guided, and the other is service-minded. A spirit-guided individual we defined as a believer whose thoughts, words, and actions reflect submission to the Holy Spirit. We examined a number of passages, including Ephesians 5, Galatians 5, uh, and 2 Corinthians 10, to discover what it means to be spirit-guided. I will say this, that you cannot be an effective leader for God if you do not embrace the importance of being spirit-guided in all of your decisions. Um, you may be able to be successful in the eyes of the world, but you will not be a successful leader if you are not guided by the Holy Spirit. Uh, it's going to require great uh, diligence in prayer, consistency, uh, and a willingness to do whatever it is that God may lead you to do. We want to focus here tonight on the second aspect of the definition, and that is this idea of being service-minded in our leadership. And there is obviously no greater example than that of Jesus Christ, and that's found for us here in John chapter 13. As we did with this idea of being a spirit-guided individual, I want us to take a definition and, and try to work a little bit with this. And this is uh, something I've just kind of pondered over and have developed and, and tried to tweak and, and uh, hopefully it would at least serve as a basis. I, you are more than welcome to uh, take and refine it. I only charge royalty fees for uh, just a small portion. Uh, here's what I came up with as I, I thought through what does it mean to be a service-minded leader? Service-minded leadership is a mindset whereby a leader chooses to regard the needs of others ahead of his own personal worth and agenda and intentionally invests his life in the lives of those whom he leads for the glory of God. There's a lot with that. I want to keep that definition up because I want to point to a couple of uh, aspects of this definition. There are some who will define leadership by things such as taking the lead role 
or establishing uh, one as the dominant force in the room, or maybe by performing actions that are going to uh, lead them away from the rest of the pack. Uh, if you listen to the news now at all, you'll hear some of the uh, various candidates and, and how they're going to try to separate themselves from the, uh, the rest of the pack. And, and you listen and listen and listen, and eventually it all gets sickening after a while. Some of these practices, I'll say, may be effective in business and they may be effective in politics, but that's not the way that God has described biblical leadership. In fact, I would argue that God has a vastly different tactic than the world, uh, and it is one that the world clearly does not embrace. The world, for example, says to assert yourself. God says to humble yourself. The world emphasizes strength. God emphasizes meekness. The world seeks to dominate. God seeks to serve. There's a lot of difference. Service leadership is a mindset. It is an attitude that the leader chooses to adopt. Uh, it's probably not going to be natural, and I would even say will probably be disregarded by some as being ineffective leadership. But the biblical leader, to be honest, is not going to be deterred by what others say. He will instead be motivated by what God has instructed. And so for someone to come along and assert that that is a poor method of leadership, to be quite honest with you, is irrelevant because it is the type that God has prescribed. It is a mindset and a choice of a particular, of a leader. He doesn't have to function that way. But he ought to. It's a mindset uh, that an individual is going to embrace when it comes to this idea of serving. It's also a mindset in accordance with this definition that is going to seek to exalt others above the uh, others first. Let's just simply say it that way. Paul taught the importance of this Philippians chapter 2. Here's what he wrote. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. There is a value that this kind of leader is going to put on other individuals and he is going to put them ahead of his own mindset. Uh, it doesn't take much to realize that kind of a mindset does not come naturally. Uh, it is one, however, that is developed as we mature in the Lord. And I would also say it's necessary to lead in a manner uh, that is pleasing to the Lord. Biblical leadership does not focus on one's position or on his prestige and make demands of service to his followers. I am this in this position of authority, therefore uh, you are to serve me. Uh, some individuals take that mindset in their own home. Husbands do. I, I know of some who, for example, uh, would take and shake their empty glass with the ice cubes in it. And that was the signal for the wife to come and, and uh, immediately get a refill. Uh, I, I might try that, but I can tell you I'm not going to get uh, a refill of water like I want it to. I, I'll get water or something. Uh, it may come uh, in a little bit of a different form. Uh, it may also come with some uh, substance that should not be uh, in, uh, you know, in, in taken in whatsoever. And I might just find myself dead. But nonetheless, uh, you go ahead and, and give this a, a noble effort here. We also observe that the leadership is an investment in the lives of others. And I think, and this is probably one of the things that is, uh, is really, to be honest with you, very close to my heart. I, I often define ministry as meeting people where they are and leading them where they need to be. And uh, I find that uh, far too often uh, individuals look at leadership as a position of authority when they are, uh, in which they are going to somehow be recognized, uh, maybe valued, or served. Uh, I, I'm your pastor, therefore you owe this to me. And I know a lot of pastors who've uh, taken that kind of a mentality and, and um, it's only right that the church serves and recognizes this uh, position of authority. Well, it is a, a position of authority, but is primarily a position of service uh, to others. And so uh, it's, a, it's a challenge to sometimes balance all of that, but uh, biblical leadership, I think, sees instead an investment in someone else. And it chooses to make that kind of an investment in that person. 
And finally, I would add to this as we this kind of leadership is such that go, is ultimately going to be done for uh, the glory of God. Everything that Jesus did in his life was done both intentionally as well as in obedience to the Father's plan. Never once did the Jesus seek to function outside those parameters. In fact, everything that he did was for God's glory. So when we talk about the uh, advancing our agenda, well, the reality is Jesus was very intentional in what he did, but Jesus always advanced the glory of God. There was never a point when he did not do so. Unfortunately, there are times in my leadership when I'm not advancing God's plan. Okay. When I'm not advancing God's agenda. And our uh, focus in life ought to be consumed with doing the will of God, but it is far too natural for us to focus on our own agenda and on our own worth and lose sight of God's agenda. And so the biblical leader is always going to strive to glorify the Lord. So service-minded leadership is a mind to set whereby a leader chooses to regard the needs of others ahead of his own personal worth and agenda. He intentionally invests his life in the lives of those whom he leads, and he does so for the glory of God. I want us to now move into John chapter number 13, where I believe this kind of leadership is exemplified by Jesus. John chapter 13 will observe three principles on this service-minded leadership. Number one, service-minded leadership is not altered by one's knowledge of events or people. I want you to notice verse number one. The Bible says, Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God. And the Bible continues that he rose up and began washing the feet of the disciples. As John continues this discourse, and it ultimately began back in uh, chapter number 12 uh, to an extent, well, uh, let me not make that same. In chapter 13, here's Jesus is about to um, enter into the Garden of Gethsemane. This is on the final night, and um, sometime the, the hours, the Bible says, the, uh, we're into a, a time frame that would be between the um, afternoon and darkness as the day begins to set. And the, you can read in other synoptic accounts of exactly what all takes place, but Jesus sits down with his 12 disciples in a room that is furnished and prepared as uh, other passages describe. And this is the point where John begins his narrative. Jesus knew everything that was about to transpire. Jesus, when you begin to ponder this, knew that the hour of which John speaks so frequently had now arrived. All throughout John, you find, my hour is not yet come. My hour is not yet come. And now in John chapter 13, the hour has come. And Jesus knew this. This was everything that his life was invested towards. But Jesus knew all of the events that would transpire over the next 24 to 36 hours. There's an amazing statement that is found for us in the end of verse number 1, where it is stated that Jesus loved his own which were in the world, and he loved them unto the end. Let me ask you this. Was this group of disciples that Jesus loved a perfect group? Oh, no. In fact, we're going to see uh, over the next 24 to 36 hours how imperfect these individuals truly are. But in spite of the knowledge that Jesus had of what would transpire, his love for them and his willingness to serve them was never altered in any way. 
His focus changes from the masses who rejected him earlier on in the Gospel of John to now suddenly focusing on the handful of individuals who embraced him. This is the small group of individuals that he is going to ultimately devote his entire, uh, the closing hours of his life and of his ministry. The Bible also adds in verse number two that supper, having come to be, probably would suggest as the passage continues, <clears throat> that supper was actually in the process of occurring and Satan had already moved Judas Iscariot to betray him. And since the anointing of Jesus by Mary earlier on, you find that Judas had looked for an opportunity to betray him. And suddenly we come into John chapter 13, and this is the opportunity for which this individual had been waiting. Jesus also has a knowledge that all things have been given into his hand. That he had come from God and that he was ultimately going to return to God. Jesus possessed, I believe, an absolute knowledge of all that was intended to transpire. The way that John describes these first three verses, I believe, are intended to give us a background that helps the events for verses 4 through 17 stand out in an even brighter fashion. Here is this individual who knows all of these things, and notice how he behaves himself. He does not sit there and demand that these disciples serve him though clearly he is worthy of it. He does not regard the faults and failures of these individuals and then choose to suddenly not invest his life in them. He still loved them even unto the end. <clears throat> when I was entering into the ministry, an individual uh, gave me a, a pretty solid piece of advice. He said, just remember, you're going to uh, see and hear a lot of people's dirty laundry. <laughs> And uh, boy, has that statement ever rung true. And uh, it is amazing sometimes what you know about individuals and uh, just the reality of, of the nature of ministry. And if you've ever been involved in any kind of ministry, you'll find that same thing. You could be simply a teacher uh, in a schoolroom setting and you'll find things out about the parents that you didn't want to find out. And uh, all of a sudden you know. And how do you handle it now when those parents come into your room? It's a whole other matter, isn't it? You know what they say about you outside that room, and now you know what they're saying to you inside that room, and the two don't match. Have you ever known somebody has an ulterior motive, yet you have an opportunity to serve them? Do you know how hard that can be? It's great when everything's hunky-dory, as we like to say. But when that's not the case, how much do you want to serve that person? Let's take it and narrow it down to just settings within our own homes. Spouses occasionally have moments where they are not controlled by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Battles, fight, dog houses are opened, uh, whatever the case might be. And, and the reality of uh, a married couple who supposedly is living in bliss is now suddenly not speaking to each other. In those moments, I don't care whether you are male or female, but since I'm dealing with the men today, men, do you want to serve your spouse? Serve her something, but not kindness. You see? Service-minded leadership is not altered by one's knowledge of either events or people. It is difficult to serve some individuals. Incidentally, you don't have to be one of those individuals that it's difficult to serve. Okay, You can choose to be that way, but there's no reason to be. You don't have to be difficult over absolutely everything. Just be difficult over half the things. Look at the improvement that would be made. 
Uh, but we, we look at, at these aspects of things. Sometimes it is very hard to want to serve those who have wronged us. Jesus provides an excellent example of what it means to be a service-minded leader. You remember in the definition, I pointed out that it was uh, a decision that an individual made. It was an, a, an attitude, a mindset, maybe it's a mindset, that I think the word was the word I used. A mindset, and then later on emphasize that it was a choice. You aren't always going to feel like serving people. In fact, I dare say there'll be many times you don't feel like serving people. Take an unsaved person at work who mistreats you, makes fun of you, makes fun of your faith, whatever the case might be, and he asks for a glass of water. It's easy to say, you know what? Get it yourself. What do I look like? By the way, be careful asking that question, okay? Somebody uh, with a lousy sense of humor may say some very inappropriate things. So uh, don't, don't go down that path, but what do you want to say? Well, you know what, what? Am I your servant? Get up and get your own water. Your leg's broken, your arm's broken, whatever the case might be. You ask me for all this, and now you want me to walk back to the truck and get you something to drink? you got to be kidding me. Service-minded leadership. Men, those of you who have children, your children are going to do some stupid things sometimes. Service-minded leadership. Think of how our homes would be revolutionized if we embrace this concept. Think of what our ministry would have the potential of doing if every man in here would embrace this kind of leadership. Number two, service-minded leadership always seeks the well-being of others. Interestingly, out of the four accounts, John's gospel is the only account that actually contains the record of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. But when you study the other accounts, what you discover in Luke chapter 22 is that they were actually up here arguing over which one of them would be the greatest. Now, of all times to argue, this was not the time. I, I wonder if the disciples looked back after Jesus had died and wished they could have had that moment back. We spent those last few hours with him, and part of those hours we spent arguing which one of us would be the greatest. And so, without a doubt, this act of Jesus would be a tremendous contrast to the argument, and it may have even been done to settle the argument. Jesus or the teaching, rather, in Philippians chapter 2, is perfectly exemplified that Jesus took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. I want to emphasize that the form of God was not exchanged for the form of a servant. It was revealed in the form of a servant. A little bit later on, Peter, in writing, talks about all of us are to be clothed with humility. I can't help but think Peter would look back on this particular incident. Jesus, the Bible says, rises from supper, verse 4, and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. Now, <clears throat> you imagine today... If as you entered, we all of a sudden said, okay, we just need somebody to go through here and wash everyone else's feet. All I need is a volunteer. There's not a hand going to go up. In fact, if you have to sneeze or cough, you're not going to raise your hand to cover the sneeze or the cough. We don't want any sign that this would be something we would volunteer for whatsoever. To most people, feet are like just disgusting, okay? If you are a germaphobe, feet are disgusting squared, okay? Uh, there, there are germs, and then there are feet germs, and that's just beyond disgusting. <clears throat> and here is Jesus. What a picture. Setting aside his garments and taking this towel and beginning to wash the feet of the disciples. The task was normally reserved for a servant. It would seem as though there was no servant present in the room. Isn't it interesting that none of the disciples volunteered to do this? 
Traditionally, this would be an act that would be done as soon as an individual entered the home. The fact that it is occurring after supper would suggest there was certainly sufficient time for someone to have done this. Not me. You do it. You do it. You do it. And before long, we get through all the you do it's and we get right back to the circle and nobody does it. Isn't that how that often happens? Well, someone else will do it. Well, someone else will do it. Well, someone else will do it. And eventually, we just keep walking right around the circle. And eventually, we get back to the first person who said someone else will do it, and nobody else has done it. And that is exactly what is taking place. I don't know where Peter was sitting, and I don't know how many feet of the disciples Jesus had already washed. But Peter is the only one who verbally protests the action. And we say, well, man, you know, Peter, here's Peter sticking his mouth in his foot. Oh, again. Uh, let me ask you this. I, I have personally a much bigger problem with none of the other disciples protesting this. Where are they all at? Were they just thinking it and refused to say it? Were they thinking, this is great, Jesus is washing my feet? What a, a, a thought. I, I have personally no issue with Peter's statement. Well, well he doesn't understand the theological implications. Of, uh, no duh, you think? He's sitting here getting his feet washed. Is he thinking theology class 101? Okay. But yet when we, we look at all of this, there are great concerns to me as to why no one else has this kind of an issue. And so Peter, I don't think he has an issue with the fact that his feet need to be washed. He's not saying, oh Lord, no. Oh. I've had this dirt on my feet for two days. I don't want it washed off. I'm trying to wait until Saturday and take my weekly foot washing uh, ceremony. I, that's not Peter's issue. Peter's issue is not the fact of his feet being washed. It's the fact that Jesus is washing his feet. This is backwards to Peter. It's, this is my Lord. This is my Master. This is the one I love. This is the one who just recently said, I will go and I will die for him. You can't wash my feet. <laughs> it's like a king coming in and washing my feet. That's not going to happen. And this is the protest that Peter has. Peter cometh, verse 6, And cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter doesn't really seem to embrace that thought right there. Thou shalt never wash my feet. <clears throat> Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Okay, fine. Wash me from my head to my toes. <laughs> Perhaps there is a little bit of extreme. <clears throat> Jesus saith to him, he that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every, every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, ye are not all clean. Did Jesus wash the feet of Judas Iscariot? Yeah. What would you have done? Oh, I'll wash them. <laughs> Here's a nice big bowl of acid. Here's a wire brush that I'm sure they would have invented. Just dip your feet in this. Let's watch your toes disintegrate for just a little while. You see, you remember Jesus knew everything that was gonna transpire? What an example for us to follow. Now, theologians question what all is intended here with Peter's statement. I don't wanna take the time to get into that. But let me just simply say it this way. The initial cleansing takes place at salvation. And as you walk through life, your feet get dirty. You need to wash your feet. You need to maintain fellowship with him. Amen. All of us before the Lord need to have frequent foot washing sessions. I want to move on to this third point. Service-minded leadership seeks to elevate others by establishing an example to follow. He sits down, verse 12, and he asks them this question. Know ye not what I have done, or know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say well, for so I am. You're acknowledging this truth. 
<clears throat> you call me your master, you call me your Lord. That's an accurate statement. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Now, what Jesus is not doing, thankfully, is instituting an ordinance to be observed by the church. There is nothing in Scripture <clears throat> that would suggest we would interpret this in any other way than the cultural necessity of washing feet. That was just the way it was then. It's not today. You have a shower. Go use it. Wash your own feet. But the point of it is this. The example of humility. Serve one another. The servant is not in a position that is greater than the master. Neither he that is sent, the disciple, is not greater than him that sent, or than he that sent him, Jesus. Here's the problem. We often tend to regard serving others as beneath our dignity. And we have developed an entirely faulty concept of what it means to be a service-minded leader. Say, well, I, I, I know this. That's great. That's why verse 17 is there. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. When does the true blessedness take place? When you put these things into practice. As I look out tonight, I don't know that there is anybody here who is unfamiliar with this story. Perhaps there are some. But the vast majority, if not all of us, are familiar with this story and have heard this story. Has the fact of this story changed how you lead? Or is it just simply something else that has been put into the mind along with a bunch of other facts? This lesson that is here in John chapter 13 is not a lesson that is intended on just giving us knowledge. It is intended on providing us with principles that we are to apply. It is intended on directing us to a mindset of spiritual leadership and doing so through service oriented my, uh, a service oriented mindset we've examined what i think are at least two of the necessary ingredients for biblical leadership i am not going to sit here and say these are the only two these are the only two we have covered today, okay? Uh, but there are many others that we could look at. Number one, you have to be a spirit-guided leader. Men, I've addressed you much today. Are you a spirit-guided leader? Number two, you are to be a service-minded individual. Once again, men, are you service-minded or do you expect everyone else to do for you? Men, it's okay to step out of your comfort zone and turn an oven on. It's okay to do something maybe you've never done before. Wash a dish. Load a dishwasher. Those can be some amazing things. Some of you might be able to even walk around and say, I run things around my house. The vacuum cleaner, the washing machine, the dishwasher, okay, any other appliance there might be. <clears throat> but let me tell you this, men, you ought not be the kind of husband that sits back and demands your spouse do everything and wait on you hand and foot. That's not right. And if that's your mindset when it comes to, church, or when it comes to your home, 
you will carry that same mindset into church and you'll do nothing more than sit on a pew and soak in information and do nothing to contribute towards the ministry. That is not God's plan. God has a plan where we are to be service-minded. Take what we learn and go tell the world. Go make a difference in the area that God has brought us into. That is a biblical leader. And that's the type of leader that this world, this society, and this church is in desperate need of. The question, men, to you, are you willing to be that kind of a leader?